What did we say about color earlier in that particular population? Do you remember? Anybody? Besides reading the two rules up there? <laughs> yeah, literally, do not ask your reader to make a choice based on color alone. Don't use color as the only means of conveying information. And make sure you use sufficient contrast. And I actually like this video. This is pretty cool. They do a good job. Creating accessible documents in Microsoft Word 2010. Colors and contrast. Appropriate colors and contrast are necessary for people to see our words and understand their meaning. This is especially true for people who are colorblind or have other visual disabilities. We create documents to communicate. We invest our time organizing our thoughts and carefully choosing our words so we can deliver a clear, concise message. If we then put it all down in a way people cannot read or understand, we have not done our best at communicating. There are two very simple rules when it comes to color and contrast in our documents. Rule one. Do not ask your reader to make a choice based on the color alone. Did you know that an estimated 8% of the population is colorblind? If color is used as the only visual means of conveying a message, asking for a response or identifying a visual element, then what is a person who is colorblind to do? Let's suppose for a moment that you are asking your reader to make a choice based on color. Your closing line may go something like, if you want to generously donate your next paycheck to my favorite charity, sign in the green box. If you prefer to donate the $5 minimum, sign in the red box. Where should the colorblind reader sign? Most likely, they won't sign at all. If you do choose to add color or shading to your document, make sure that the information conveyed in color is also available without color. In the prior example, you might add the appropriate text to the two boxes just to be sure the message is clear. Rule two, use sufficient contrast. A recent design trend involves presenting gray text in small sans serif fonts on white background. People with visual disabilities, including those with aging eyes, cannot read this. In fact, even people with perfectly good eyesight have some problems with this. In most cases, it is enough to say we must use sufficiently contrasting foreground and background colors. But for those who want more exact... Okay, I'm not going to go to the exacting definitions because those are in the standards and we'll look at those at the end of the day. Notice I have not shown you a single standards document. I've done this on purpose because you're already designing the standard. I want you to feel comfortable with the process before you look at what Web Content Accessibility Guidelines looks like. We'll wait until the end of the day and then you'll be surprised how much you're already designing to and then know that, because if I introduced this document to you at the beginning of the day, you would have just looked at me and said, what? No way. No, I don't want that to happen. So, um, color specifically, you want to make sure, again, excuse me, that you use color not as the only means of conveying information. You want to make sure that we have good contrast.
zoology, art appreciation. Yeah, that's a different concept. Now we're dealing with descriptions. Now the other component dealing with description and complex graphics is to think of it like this. If I was in the classroom and I was working with an individual who was blind in my class and I'm using a visual aid and this is the way you need to think about it when you're actually reviewing materials. If I'm using a visual aid, I would need to describe how that visual aid applies to the curriculum and how I'm using it in that course. Same thing. You're applying the assessment components of that visual aid and how that's working in that curriculum and why you're using it. Now in that process, then not only are you going to then benefit that individual who is blind so they understand what it is that you're doing, but then you're going to benefit everybody because it's rather amazing how many people actually benefit from that extra description of these elements. Very often unwilling to ask questions about it and consistently we have seen more and more instances when this is happening where you have the entire class showing a benefit because the average goes up a little bit. So keep that in mind. When you're dealing with descriptions, you want to assess and complex, I'm saying. You want to describe what you want the student to know out of that graphic and identify the graphic in the alt text. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. In the complex, it would be the description in the body itself. So the text will be in the body. For the alt text identification, if you want to provide that identification to everybody else, you could caption it if you'd like. Or don't worry about it because they're going to identify it because it's a graphic and you're going to be describing that graphic anyway. Does that make sense? The reason why you're using the alt text that nobody else sees is specifically for that individual using an assistive technology to get access to it. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, it's driving me crazy. Maybe he's tied. That's up to you. I, I, title is not necessary to, to meet code. Okay. Um, if you use title, make sure it isn't the same thing you're using in the description. Okay. That's up to you. But I personally, I never do. I let the graphic stand for itself, or if anything, I might capture, but that's it. Um, the thing you have to do is put your description in description, because that's where it puts the, in the code, so the screen reader will come to it, it will parse it and see that's where the alt text is. Does that make sense? OK, good. So while that's good, if you have any questions on complex descriptions, the helpful resources, the last module, has a whole bunch of resources dealing with this very issue, specifically with STEM, and a bunch of ways to address this process and resources out there for you. So, because I know how difficult, and guess what? So do a whole lot of other people. <laughs> They've been working on this for a long time. No, <laughs> we wish, <laughs> but there are a bunch of resources out there that, that will provide you access and you can email them too. And they even have objects, so that's something to look into. All right. So that was dealing with alternate text. Now let's talk about hyperlinks. So. Hyperlinks are pretty straightforward. Again, we have the directions in this and we have some references. But specifically, I'm going to do an easy hyperlink. And the thing to think about hyperlinks, well, let me first ask a question. How many of you actually put the address as a hyperlink? Hallelujah. I'm still. Well, do you? Ooh, not good. Yeah, no. We, we don't want to put the address as the hyperlink at least not the first. In other words, if you have it in line, even standing alone, you want to have the hyperlink be standalone descriptive. It tells you where it's going. 
for classes on so-and-so, go to the, with quotes, course catalog. Course catalog is the description, right? Or in this case, go ahead and create a hyperlink of whatever your graphic is. I'm going to actually make the entire portion a link. I could just put koala bears, and then I'd find out I'm going to wiki, right? And it stands alone, it's koala bears. But I want to identify a little more for the link. So that way, this is what happens, and, and this is why it's so important that it's standalone descriptive. Is an individual using a screen reader will come to that link, and it will identify it as a link. So they'll read it, and they'll know it's a link the first time through. The second time through, just like we would visually see the link that we need to go to immediately, just like headings, they would pull up a list, and it would have a list of links. And in this case, the reason why I did it this way is it would say, wiki reference for koala bears. So I know it's a wiki reference and it's for koala bears. And of course it's a link because it's in my links list. So you can imagine how difficult that is if it was the address. And let alone a Java address because you have a hotspot. Then that becomes a nightmare. So the thing to keep in mind is to make sure that standalone is descriptive. So in other words, we don't do click here. We don't do read more. None of that stuff. Because then you pull up a links list, let alone hearing it in the page, and it's a bunch of click here's and read mores. What does that tell me? Nothing at all, except for it's a bunch of click here's and read mores. And then I have to go to it to find out what it was. And if I have like, unfortunately, some landing pages of institutions put a lot of read mores, and I have five or six or seven read mores in my list,